darkness, there would be clarity, and there would be a path through the woods, through this challenge. Thank you, Jesus.
campus pastor here at our Timberline Church Windsor campus. Timberline exists as one church, different campuses in different regions, one church. And we know that there are many great Bible-believing, Jesus-loving churches in our region and our world. Our goal for you is that you would be rooted, you would be connected and known at a local church. If you're new with us, we'd love to know that you're here. You can use that QR code scanning on the screen or on, in the seat backs in front of you, or you can use that physical, what we call a connection card. Just fill it out, turn it in at guest services. We'd love to know that you're here. You can also use that uh, to share any prayer requests, any anything you need help with, any way we can connect you with others. We'd love to know about that. You can access our Timberline app with that QR code and Timberline family, whether you are giving through the Timberline app, online giving, in-person giving, whatever it looks like for you, we always wanna say thank you for your faithfulness in giving through this church so the ministry and the reach of this church can be flourishing and resourced as best we can. Uh, there is a summit class coming up next week and I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, we've moved it to the after service slot. So it's gonna start at 1130. We're gonna have summit one. And then in the middle there, we have childcare and then we're gonna pull the kids out of childcare and have pizza and, and lunch in the middle. And then we're gonna dive into summit two. Summit classes one and two are all about who we are as a church, allowing you to have the information you need to know about beliefs and opportunities to connect and, and our DNA, information you need to know. That's Summit 1. And then where you fit in, where God has called and equipped you, that's Summit 2. And so you put that all together, that's Summit class next weekend, Sunday. You don't have to RSVP, just be here. Uh, we'll have pizza and childcare, like I said, from 11.30 to 2.30. Uh, we've we've kind of curated a new Summit class. So even if you haven't been for a while, this is a great opportunity for us to explain in a fresh way, a new way, what you need to know about the church and what it means for you in connecting. So looking forward to that. This weekend, um, I'm gonna invite Liz Brzezinski up because as, as much as we need to hear about an opportunity that Liz and also Brittany are gonna be a part of in respite care for our foster care efforts, what you need to know first is you need to hear a little bit about the Brzezinski family story and what God has done in them and through them and in this church family. So Liz, take it from there. Thank you. Um, as many of you guys know, uh, my husband Chris and I decided to become foster parents about six years ago. And our first and only placement was two little kiddos that came to us. They were three and a half and seven months old when they first came to us. And it was pretty apparent right away that God had placed our family together for a very specific purpose, whether that was for um, a month or a year, or whether that would be forever. Um, God definitely put us together for a reason. Um, 
but that sweet honeymoon stage lasted, as John called me out earlier, like two hours. <laughs> and um, sometimes people have longer honeymoons and that ours was not. Um, and it became very apparent on that first night when I was tucking my daughter into bed and she cried for four hours. And there was no consoling her. There was no helping her in that moment. She was just hurt and scared and had no base of trust in her life. And I was pretty sure after that first night that I would not be able to continue being her foster mom. And um, thankfully for our story, they had placed us on a Friday night. They probably do that intentionally because I could not call the caseworker until Monday and <laughs> say that I was done, which gave me this incredible time to come to church here on Sunday morning. And um, this is my home church as well. So it's really special to get to talk to you guys today because we took our kids um, back into service and I keep looking over here because they're sitting here with me, and um, it's super special to have them up here with me. But um, I took them back into service, and Anne was so gracious to us and took our kids, and they were screaming and crying, and we were a mess, and I was crying on the floor, and she graciously said, go, go get a break. Maybe, maybe stay for two services if you need to. Um, put a coffee in my hand, and I got the rest that I needed. And that's what this church family did, stepped into the gap when we needed it and gave us the support that we needed. And there are countless examples that I could bring up from Linda Russell coming to our front door and bringing clothes to help us when we needed it, or for the Olsgaard and the Burrell family who's in our small group who saw very desperately that Chris and I needed a date night and they had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> and they <laughs> were very naive, thank goodness, but they said, we can listen to a kid cry for two hours while she goes to bed. Let us do that. You guys go get a date night out. And um, John and Kirsten for opening their doors when we just needed a babysitter last minute, the Smalley family for helping us when I didn't know where else to go. And they watched Abiel for me when I thought I couldn't do another minute. That's what this church family did. And I have the privilege now of working for the organization that trained us to become foster parents. I work for Project 127 and I do exactly this. I go to other churches and tell them more about foster care and about what it means to be a foster parent and stepping in the gap for kids that are in vulnerable situations. And I tell the church about my church family and what they did for us and help them say, it may not be your calling right now to be a foster family, but you can support a foster family. Yeah. And um, this church does a really great job of that. We're involved in, a, in numerous ways that I won't go into, but one really fun way that we're doing um, in the next month, we're gonna be hosting a respite event here for parents, foster parents to come drop their kiddos off for a three hour event. And Chris and Brittany are gonna be, they're making a really fun party night. We're gonna have live music and a dance party um, right here in this living room. The kids are gonna have a great time. And then they get to go do crafts and a sensory hour. They get to go have pizza and a movie. And all this time, while we have the kids partying here, the parents get to go spend a $50 gift card on us to go out to dinner or go shopping or just go catch a nap. Um, and we get to do that. So if you guys would like to join us um, and uh, volunteer for the respite event, the more hands make it definitely the more better. We'd love to have you yeah. guys. Awesome. Well, the world of foster care can be an intimidating place. Yes. Um, I think for a lot of us who know what that world looks like, it, it, it's a deep, deep need. But kind of like people, some people are called to be missionaries, right? Some people are called to go across seas and stuff like that and be full-time missionaries. And and some of us hear those stories and go, that's great, awesome, good for you. I don't know that that's my story. Well, that's fine. It doesn't have to be everybody's story, but it does have to be everybody's story that we care. And so maybe you're somebody that like Liz and Chris, how many years ago was the orphan care service that kind of... That was over 10 years ago that okay. we first had the calling. So <laughs> there was a service where, where we had that, that just tugged your hearts in a way that you felt like this isn't just a universal call. This is a specific responsibility. And maybe that's where you're at. And if that's where you're at, we want you to connect with Liz, connect with Well DHS, connect with opportunities to get more information or just talk with them, ask questions of them. But for all of us, it's something that we need to step in. And if that's not what God's tugging on your heart, then supporting people that are in there, like the respite event is a great way to do that. Um, we know that God's heart for these kids is outshines our heart in ways that, that we can't even fathom. But one of the things we kind of uncovered as Pastor Patrick was talking about in a pre-service meeting earlier is we kind of found that there's a specific song with Brittany. It's not a mistake that she's up here on stage after leading the respite event that she's gonna do. That this song is a song that cries out God's heart to anybody in need, anybody that feels they're desperate. Certainly that uniquely applies to foster care families and especially the kids. 
kids that have this family history that for whatever reason isn't exactly whole and together, but this is God's heart for them. Let's stay seated and listen to this. beside us and Lord I thank you that you especially have a huge amazing heart for children that are struggling for children who don't have consistent homes consistent love who don't even know what real love is Lord I pray for your covering over these children and Lord, that you also, I thank you that you fill us with love so we can overflow and we can be your hands and feet for these beautiful children, Lord, because they are yours. They are yours. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
All right, well, we're going to do um, a survey on Jesus and prayer in the Gospel of Matthew. And if you've got Bibles or Bible apps uh, with you and you're coming along with me that way, and that's awesome, by the way, uh, there's going to be some pretty serious active flipping through the Bible. We got lots of Bible to cover today, and and thankfully we've got screen support if you want to follow along that way. But we're going to do a survey of Jesus and prayer in the Gospel of Matthew. What's what's a survey? It's, It's a sampling. It's an overview. A survey is a different kind of study than just following storylines. We're we're surveying the land. We're we're trying to get some elevation and trying to catch a sense of some of the bigger themes, overarching themes, because I want us to think about how fascinating the prayer life of Jesus was with the Father. (laughs) See, for Jesus, the pre-existent and second person of the Trinity Prayer wasn't just about his thought life and a constant connection with God, God knowing all of his thoughts and him knowing that God knows all of his thoughts. It was actively verbalized. For Jesus, the one and only begotten son of God, prayer wasn't just private. It was evident to others. For Jesus, God incarnate, fully God and fully man, prayer wasn't just on the way through life. He took intimate times to go away and pray. Prayer was all those things, a constant connection, private, and on the way through life, but not exclusively. For Jesus, prayer was multifaceted. It was dynamic. And that's why I want to cover this in a survey approach, specifically studying three things. And if you're an outline point person, either with the Timberline app or with the sheet that we hand out, um, I'm gonna give you those three things right off the bat, tell them what they are, and then we'll cover them individually, just because I'm so kind like that. (laughs) Our survey is gonna study Jesus teaching on prayer, Jesus praying before others, and then Jesus going to pray, like by himself. So here's the first study section, a survey on Jesus and prayer in Matthew, starting with Jesus teaching. On prayer. We're going to be in Matthew 6, verses 1 through 13, and, and this has got a lot of verses to it, and there's another passage a little bit later on that I want to spend a little bit more time on. So I'm going to briefly cover not all the verses here, but the heart. He says, verse 1, teaching on prayer, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen. Verse five, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father. Verse seven, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as Gentiles do for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, as we're going to see a little bit later, for Jesus, prayer wasn't always private, and it wasn't always short and succinct. So the implication or the lesson here is not legalistically that we should always pray in private and we should always keep our prayers prompt. It's a motives check when Jesus is teaching on prayer here. So the question is, is it to please God or people? Think about your prayer life. Maybe you're, you're here and you're distant from God and, and your prayer life is non-existent or, or very rare. And if that's where you're at, I am so thrilled that you're here and so thrilled at what we get to look at together. And if you do have a prayer life, really ask yourself, is it to please God or people? I know you're sitting there going, uh, well, it's got to be please God, right? That, that's got to be the answer. Well, hopefully, But have you ever felt the pressure of praying eloquently or boldly in front of others so that they might be impressed? One of the kind of silly or probably more accurately kind of challenging parts of being a pastor is sometimes when I'm in the room, people can feel like they have no business praying to God. Like I've got, I'm the only one in the room that's got God's direct access number. Or or they feel like they really need to spiritually bring it in a prayer. 
Now, quick note on that. I do still love praying with the church and for the church, but in lesson here, based on what Jesus taught in those first few verses, Jesus is your great high priest. He is your lead pastor. I have no more direct access to God than you do. And God wants to hear real prayers, authentic prayers from all of his people. Not just pastors. He wants to hear your heart. He wants real, not just rehearsed, polished speeches, real heart prayers. Is prayer to please God or people? Maybe you've held back from prayer because you're just not good at it or even shared prayer requests that really serve as spiritual excuses to gossip about what's going on in other people's lives. Is prayer about God or others? I don't know about you, but I hear that teaching, that motives check from Jesus, and I get a check on my motives in prayer. God, is my prayer really about you? In the next verses in this chapter of chapter six in Matthew, Jesus continues his teaching on prayer and says, pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Know this? Feel free to continue with me if you do. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, by the way, did you wanna keep going there? (laughs) <laughs> if you did, that's, that's fine, that's understandable. That's a doxology that goes, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen, right? Now, Jesus's prayer that he models that we get out of the gospel of Matthew stops, ends with deliver us from evil. And the reason for many of us that in our tradition or what we've memorized, it keeps going, is in, in the medieval times in Eastern Greek Uh, medieval manuscripts, there was a doxology added for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And then from that medieval Greek manuscript, the King James version was based on that. And so now it makes sense that anybody that grew up in a Protestant religion or a Protestant denomination or grew up with the King James, you will remember it as for thine is the kingdom. And you could probably think that it's King James because it uses the word thine. That's not something we don't usually use, but that's where it comes from. It was added a little bit later. So when Jesus teaches on prayer, he provides this, a model, what's been called the Lord's Prayer as a model or an example of how to pray. Not specifically what to pray or exclusively what to pray, but how to pray. It's a model. So as we look at prayer, as we look at this prayer as a model, an example, notice how reverence comes before personal needs. And then even then, when the personal needs are expressed, they're expressed in a community context. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Deliver us from evil. Even prayer, vertical, is relationally connected in community and connection, horizontal. And also in this model, notice how it's relational. It's real. Yes, there's deep reverence, deep respect, and yet it's not mechanical. That's why there's a lot of different styles or postures of prayer that people have used in combination with one another to pursue pursue vibrant, real, authentic prayer life with God. Things like praying on your knees or praying in bed or out loud or silently or hands lifted or eyes open or standing, or breathing, or repeating, and so on. These are, these are different dynamics of prayer, maybe some new ones for you to consider, all so that you would connect with the Heavenly Father in real personal prayer. Kind of makes me think of a, a scene from a show called The West Wing, um, where one of the characters, CJ, is, is trying to find out what another character, Danny, is really looking for in their relationship. And she asks something along the lines of, well, what do you want from me? Do, we, do you want me to allow you to, to make my career choices for me? Do you want me to allow you to decide where I'm gonna live next? And Danny replies, I just wanna talk about the options. I just wanna talk about how you're feeling. I just want to know what you want to do next. I just want to talk. J. 
Jesus' teaching here on, in Matthew 6 makes the point that, that it's not about feelings of inexperience or eloquent verbiage or posture. Prayer is about a God that just wants to talk. I promise you, you find ways to freely and openly talk to God in prayer that feel fresh and real and relevant and personal. You'll find the pleasure of God in prayer. Next teaching on prayer. I gotta move a little bit faster than that. Matthew chapter seven, verse seven. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus teaches that prayer can be, should be, persistent. Not just like said once, I'm sure he's got the message. He knows what I need. I'm not going to say it anymore. Jesus teaches right here. And then he models in a bit, we'll see that prayer can be and should be a persistent thing. God's not worried about redundant prayers. I've heard that one before. As much as he's worried about heartless mechanical prayers or a lack of pursuit in prayers, be persistent. Be in pursuit in your prayers, knowing that God received your prayer. No matter how he's gonna answer and what that looks like, he receives your prayer. He listens and he is a good God, faithful to you and to me, according to his good and perfect will, his good and perfect will. So when Jesus teaches on prayer, when he wants us to know specific truths about prayer, and I think we can probably take him as a good, reliable source, on that, authentic posture and communication and persistence and pursuit. That's what we see. That's what he gives us. Next piece of our survey, Jesus praying before others. The examples that we have where Jesus is praying before others. Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 26. Jesus prays directly to God, but in a way that is where he's surrounded by other people. Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. I praise you because you do what pleases you. Can you and I pray that prayer? (laughs) Or does God get praise primarily when he does what pleases me? That's a, that's a check, isn't it? A check on our motives. It is often in a person's prayers that their truest thoughts come to the surface, especially about what they desire. That's another check that that I'm taking with me in my motives. And I'm betting many others are with me on that. I praise you because you do what pleases you. Okay, moving along, Matthew 19, verse 13. Then the children, children were brought to him that he may lay his hands on them and pray. Simple example of Jesus praying before others. And in this case, he's praying a blessing over the children. So real quick, what's a blessing? A prayer of blessing, or also just called a blessing, could be a tradition that was passed down through the generations, like in the Old Testament we see with Jacob and Isaac and so on. And this in many ways is very similar to what we choose to do with child dedications. A blessing, a prayer that is declared and promised and then passed on through generations. You know, similarly to that, many of us have had people pray over us in our past. Grandparents or in-laws before we ever even met our spouse. Those are prayers that are declared and promised and passed down. That's powerful. That's a prayer of blessing. Another example is an approach that I prayed last weekend after the message, and I invited the church to join me in prayer. And in fact, two of our four songs this weekend follow this model. And it can seem kind of weird. It can seem kind of like, is it really a prayer when we are talking 
to one another, still acknowledging one another in the room, but, and we're not talking directly to God, but we're responding to his presence, can kind of feel a little different. It's kind of like a prayer blessing that I've shared with my kids for years at the end of each night. Daddy loves you. Jesus loves you even more. May you love him with all that you are. A prayer of blessing. And prayers of blessing find their fulfillment as people live according to God's plan, especially his expressed will. And the result of a prayer of blessing that's actualized in a life is positive and fruitful, hence a blessing. In Matthew 19, Jesus shows us the generous and abundant heart of God that when the children come to him, he says, as you follow the will of God, may your life be filled in positive ways and fruitful ways, prayers of blessing. All right, so I know I've been moving quickly through some stuff here in this survey approach, but now on this last point of Jesus praying before others, we're gonna really kind of slow down and, and focus in a little bit more methodically as we hit Matthew chapter 27, verse 26, single verse, a prayer of agony, Jesus praying before others as he hung on the cross. Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In his great agony, as his last words, Jesus quotes scripture. Amidst disorientation, he holds fast to the only thing that's gonna surpass his current situation. It, it reminds me, my wife and I were scuba diving recently and, and it was really blowing really hard this day. And so the water was very choppy on the surface. And even though I've been diving now at this point a, a handful of times, I tried to get beyond this very foreign feeling of initially taking a breath underwater. It's like with all the choppiness and being thrown to and fro, my, my body's just kind of like, nope, not supposed to take a breath under that wet stuff. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. And I start breathing too fast, annoyingly, and, and also known as kind of embarrassing, hyperventilating. And it's so annoying to me because what's happened every single time this has happened, I really hope this time was gonna be different, but it wasn't. What's so annoying to me is that all it takes is about five to 10 seconds, calm down and get beyond just the moment. It's like something in me was saying, calm down, trust the good air that you've got and move forward. And amidst disorientation and even perceived agony, something beyond my situation tells me to get beyond just the moment. In the midst of true agony, facing immense pain and all kinds of sensory overload and disorientation, Jesus cries out, holding fast to scripture, crying out to God with good words. He's quoting Psalm 22, verse one, that says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he's quoting it even in the original language, hence the translation that we get in our Bibles. And here's what's so cool, so cool about this. I don't think I've seen this before because like we said before, prayer gives an insight into what's really within a person, kind of like a crest tube, toothpaste example that I've used before, that whatever you put in that tube is what's going to come out under pressure. This, in his last words, final moments of agony, Psalm 22, 1 is what comes out. And why is that so cool? Because of the rest of Psalm 22. Jesus quotes the first verse of Psalm 22, which starts as a cry of agony, which might sound like defeatist. I'm done. God, why have you forsaken me? But that's only the first verse of the Psalm. Something that our connection groups are going to go through in a deeper way. This group is keep reading Psalm 22, keep reading what he's quoting. And that Psalm takes my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A prayer of agony and moves through that ultimately to be a Psalm of victory, a cry of victory. Even in prayers of agony, 
we preach, we encourage, we almost command our souls to see the assurance of victory, the goodness and the faithfulness of God. See beyond just the moment. That's something powerful in Jesus's last words in prayer before others. So cool there. But we're not done. Our last section of our survey is also going to look at the times Jesus went away by himself to pray. Matthew 14, verse 23. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, what's the, what's the content of this prayer? We don't know. That wasn't for us to know. That was intimate between Jesus and God the Father. But what we do know and what we can clearly see is that there was an intimacy between Jesus and the Father in prayer. And that's good for us to see because we know even Jesus is gonna need it. Even Jesus is gonna need to draw from that deep, personal, intimate relationship with God. We saw a little bit of that in his last words, cried out Psalm 22, one on the cross. And never do we see a more clear example of Jesus's intimacy with God the Father than in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. I'll stop right there and say, this is how we know that Jesus modeled persistent prayers. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Gethsemane, the, the name means oil press. And if you go to Israel, you will know that Gethsemane is a garden just on the other side of the valley. You could throw a baseball or a football from the garden of Gethsemane and hit the walls of Jerusalem. Jesus is standing there overlooking Jerusalem. I have a picture from when my wife and I visited this. Uh, this is like a 2000 year old olive tree, maybe the same kind of tree or the same tree that Jesus fell at when he fell into the arms of the father in prayer. I share pictures like this, by the way. I want us to know, Garden of Gethsemane, this isn't Narnia. This is real. This is our God, what he really did. And it's overlooking Jerusalem, the place of pressure, Gethsemane. And with him, Jesus invites his inner circle. And once again, like we talked about last week and the week before and the week before and the week before and the week before, community is all over this. Jesus invites his friends with him to share with him in the pressing, in the pressure. But who wants that? <laughs> I mean, I'm good with Pastor Derry's message a couple of weeks back when he shared and invited us all to be practicing the way of Jesus in celebration. You invite me to one of those, I'll join you with that. But this pressure, hardship, struggle, heaviness and burdens, but even Jesus needed that. The burden was brought before God in prayer and he invited those closest to him to share with him in this as well. Help me with this burden. Let me know that you're there with me. 
Wow. What Jesus was bearing in that moment and in the agonizing moments to come was the whole purpose of his life. What was going to happen was not a surprise to Jesus. It wasn't a mistake. It was the greatest agony and sorrow and fulfillment of his whole life's purpose to bear upon himself the sins of mankind so that we can be forever reconciled. Jesus prayed the prayer, why have you forsaken me, God, so that you and I would never have to. We need to see this dynamic in Jesus's prayer life. We need to see what he bore so that we wouldn't have to. What do you say to that? Maybe thank you, maybe love you, maybe praise you, or maybe nothing at all. Not that our response to God is nothing, but that we actually practice a prayer of saying nothing. There's gonna be something a little different here. Honestly, because I'm convicted that, that while it's absolutely my job and my honor to have this sermon time, when it comes to genuine personal prayer time, from what we've seen in what Jesus taught and modeled, that's something I can't do for you. Oh yes, we do and we can and we should pray for one another and with one another. But God wants your heart. So clear the noise, clear the norms and maybe even the normal comfort of the way weekend services usually go. Clear even the petitions and the requests that shout through your life, not forever. Those are good things, but just for right now. And we're gonna have some space to ask a question and then try to still our hearts in a posture of listening. What do you have to say, God? What do you have to say, God? something, I would love for you to write it down. Don't move past this moment too quickly. Grab your phone, grab one of the connection cards in the seat backs, write it down. Because that is an impression, a word, a message from the Lord God Almighty. Hold on to that. And whether there was something impressed in you or not, and it's totally normal, totally healthy if not, there was something in my prayer time ahead of all of this, ahead of all of this message that God impressed on my heart in order that I can share it with you. And we will have it available for you to take home and keep in front of you if you want on your way out. We simply called it a note from your heavenly father. I want you to know, I wanna draw near to you have you lean into me in prayer. I want your heart. I want to hear about your day. I want you to know that you can trust me. I want you to know I am not hidden from your every moment, even if you want me to be. We won't have the intimacy and vibrant relationship that I desire with you without authentic communication and connection. Prayer is way more than just the words. It's love. Will you stand?
stand and join us? share the 
the sticky note prompt that we'd love to invite you into. We'd love to share. If, if you're really quiet and listening before God, what's one thing he has put on your heart? You can share that. You can write that on that sticky note. We'd love to bring that together. And as the last word, as, as the parting idea, we may look at the prayer life of Jesus and be like, yeah, of course he had God before him and behind him and beside him and within him and all around him. But what we learn from his example is that he was forsaken so that could be our reality. You go with a God that is before you and behind you and beside you and within you because of what Jesus has done. Prayer allows us to enter into that intimacy. Let's go as people of prayer, as a church of prayer. Love you guys. Go be the church.